Good morning and warm welcome to you all this morning for our service here at St. David's. I have just a few reminders. This afternoon it's messy church, so there will be no ser evening service tonight. Again, in the hall, in the coffee lounge, is a form for you to fill in if you would like to join us for a lunch on the 9th of October to welcome Nigel and Lucy. As normal, there will be tea and coffee after this morning's service. Now, Helen would like a word with you. A week ago, I wasn't able to be in church, but I know Eric told you about a Ukrainian family who've moved into a house next door, but one to us. And I was given a list, and I promised I would ask my church to find the things on that list. And in just the week, we have completed the list. Um, we've also got enough donations for them to buy a microwave and some other little things that will make the house into a home. They haven't got much furniture or anything on the wall. Um, so if anybody would like to donate financially, that would go to help them for that. So Maria and Ole and Evelina and Diana, had to write them down, wanted me to thank you all because they really have been overwhelmed by your generosity. The eyes just filled with tears when I took everything down. And they insisted that I sat with Google Translator in our hands, a cup of tea and a cinnamon bun. So on behalf of all of them, Diakyu, thank you. Thank you, that was lovely. It just gives me great pleasure to welcome our own minister, the Reverend Nigel Rogers, who's going to lead us in our worship this morning. Welcome, Nigel. We look forward to hearing what you have to say this morning. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, to explain, when we, uh, we come to our hymns, uh, there'll be hymns that are chosen particularly as we prepare for what the nation will be sharing in, indeed, what the Commonwealth and the whole world will be sharing in uh, tomorrow. Uh, so we will be having two hymns uh, written uh, particularly with the uh, Queen in mind uh, and one in particular with uh, this, uh, this period of mourning uh, in mind, but also hymns that we will be singing to familiar tunes. Uh, so the words will be strange as they come up on the screens, uh, but there is uh, nothing to fear there. Let's just pause. We ask ourselves, why have we come together? And that we come to worship God. That we gather to ask, what can we give to God? That we come to the realization that is all that we say and do, all that we are. And to ask whilst we're gathered, what does God want from us? And as Jesus reminds us, to love as God loves us. And to ask ourselves, how can we show that love? And to work out how for each one of us, and together, we do that by seeking justice, and peace, and living in God's generosity. And so we sing our first hymn, which was sung at the Queen's coronation. Number one, all people that on earth do dwell.
submit with the introduction that I've had into Clan Did now, uh, I almost felt inclined to ask you to sit down just then because it seems that with two funerals and a, a very civic service, even though it wasn't the planned one last week at St John's, I've been having to tell congregations to do things that we assume uh, more often than I'm used to. So I had to stop myself saying, please be seated at that point. But sometimes it's good to be reminded that although those of us who are here regularly might be used to what's happening, uh, that actually not everybody is. And our purpose here is to welcome others into God's kingdom and God's presence. So let's do that together now in prayer. Holy God, as we meet together, help us to be aware of your presence, creating us a desire to build your kingdom, so that as we listen to your word and sing your praises, we will understand how to be your people wherever you have placed us. Generous God, maker, saviour, counsellor. We come to you with all that we have, a community gathered in your name. May we hear what you have to say to us today and live our lives as an act of praise so that from sunrise to sunset, from east to west, from earth to heaven and heaven to earth, we can proclaim that your name is worthy to be praised and that your glory shines above all things because we worship and adore you, our wonderful God. And so, wise and wonderful maker, we thank you for all that you provide. We thank you for the blessings you bring us, large and small, Open our eyes to see all your acts of goodness and to recognize what resources we have and acknowledge that all that we have comes from you. And we thank you that with your help, great and wonderful things can be achieved and that we can be part of bringing beauty and peace and blessing to the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me pray our prayer of confession. Lord, we regret the times that we've been unwise or short-sighted. When we've not thought through the implication and the impact of our actions, Give us the ability to make adjustments to our lives. To change the course that we feel is set for us. And to build each other up. And to invest ourselves in ways that are beneficial to all. Help us when we get confused. When things aren't black and white when we injure others and ourselves, whether deliberately or accidentally, whether on purpose or without thought. Forgive us, restore us, and help us to repair that which has been broken. Loving God, you turn your face from our wrongdoing, but you do not turn away from us. Every time we come to you, acknowledging our woundedness and our folly, you bring us back 
You see the person you made and call us to be and wipe the slate clean again. There's no residue left behind, no mark on our record that you cannot erase. You embrace us unconditionally and turn our brokenness to beauty. And so we thank you, all-forgiving God. Restore us to you and to your community. Amen. We pray the prayer that Jesus great gave us when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so the first of our hymns to a familiar tune, but particular for this time. Once a woman heard a message telling of her father's death. Our sermon, when we come to it, will be something completely unrelated to uh, what's happening uh, for most of us in the world at the moment, uh, apart from the fact that it will relate to the world and how we live our lives and what Jesus has to teach us. But I just thought I'd spend a few moments at this time because it is important that we acknowledge uh, what has happened both with the Queen and with the change that we have, the transformation from all of us getting used to thinking of Charles as king. And I've noticed how when broadcasters are talking about him very often, they will refer to him as King Charles III, almost as if they've got to go through that in order to remember. But I think we've all found it interesting to see how 
There has been for Charles and with Camilla alongside him uh, a real sense of duty and following in his mother's footsteps uh, through these past days. Uh, I know Lucy and I were particularly watching <laughs> uh, we, we were particularly watching how they were both sitting through the, uh, the gathering at the legislative body in Scotland and listening first to the speaker, uh, and I can't remember their official title of speaking, and then Nicholas Sturgeon, and then various representatives of each party, almost as if everybody had to have their say, and there was all this thing of everybody having to take their turn. And as it went on, increasingly less of it was uh, to do with anything that hadn't been said before. It had all been said over the past few days and in different places, and they were having to, uh, to sit through that in the, uh, the midst of their griefs. Do I need to go somewhere else? I, I'm just aware that sometimes if I move around it, it messes with microphone. Uh, so, hmm? You want to go to the right then? Right, okay. I'll stand behind the barrier then. <laughs> and it just said that they were, they were having to go all through this stuff. And if you saw Camilla looking across at Charles, then you could see that she was concerned for him. Because this was a man who was also grieving for his mother. And so not only was it a sense of duty, but also it was a sense of having to suffer something, and I think there was some suffering in that, uh, in order to do what was required of him for others, and so it becomes sacrificial as well. One of the things that strikes me about the Queen's coronation is that it not only brought the Queen officially into the place that she was always destined and ordained to be, but also it had about it that sense of bringing both God and his people close together, heaven and earth closer together, because there was all the, the wonder and awe of the ceremony. And I think one of the ways that that becomes particularly focused is in those impressive stones, the two parts of the Cullinan diamond, one in the crown and one in the scepter, that are a real focus of all the pomp and the glory of what is happening, but also the wonder of God's creation. Carbon being formed under tremendous pressure and then the work of human hands. Hands made in the image of the living God in order to work with that and make it something even more beautiful if that could ever be. And it's almost then like a piece of heaven is brought in amongst us. And the Queen has lived in that way pretty much since. Because one of the things which she said of her is that she behaved in a way which made her almost impossible a lot of the time to protect in the way that she came amongst people. And she chose to be like that because she didn't want there to be the gulf between her and the people. Yes, she had her royal standing. But then we saw again yesterday Charles walking along the lines of those gathered in London. And I can remember one woman particularly being interviewed or being spoken to after she met him. And a policeman has said, just wait, just wait here, because something's going to happen. And she had no idea what, because it was so planned and unscripted. And so she met her new king. And all of us, I think, know as somebody who had those sorts of encounters where it seems that the Queen, no matter who you were, was interested when she met you as to who you are 
and she made everybody feel as though they had worth, no matter who they were. And I go back to the words at the beginning of John's Gospel. And the Word was God, with God, and the Word was God, and was made flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. In John's Gospel, the Word which is used for dwelling is also the Word for tabernacle. And if you remember anything about the tabernacle, going back to the days of Exodus, it was where the holy of holies were found as they lived in their temporary dwelling in Sinai and all the places around. And that sense of bringing the glory of God into the barrenness of our lives. In Jesus, but also in the way that some people have followed their ordained duty. And so we'll have a glimpse of that yet again tomorrow as we pay our respects to our Queen. And we'll have another glimpse of that when we have the coronation, but also everything that lies beyond. As King Charles III, no matter how you feel about him, and no matter what criticism or praise he may have had, and he's had plenty of criticism in his life, in his long apprenticeship, will do his best to do his duty and to serve his country and to serve his God. We're going to sing again now as we sing our second hymn focused uh, upon this tumultuous time we stand to mourn a sovereign a nation's guide and friend Our first reading is taken from Amos, chapter 8, and I'm reading verses 4 to 7. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? 
skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the proud of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Our second reading comes from Luke 16, the, verse, the first 13 verses, and it's entitled The Parable of the Shrewd Manager. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, hmm, what shall I do now? My master's taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, People will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. And he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take a bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. And then he asked the second, How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it eight hundred. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you're not being trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. One of the things which you may hear me mention again is uh, a little niggle of mine, uh, and that's not to be played uh, on my name, uh, is a little niggle of mine is that the little headings that you get before readings in Scripture, uh, I generally have uh, a distaste for being read out when people are reading. Uh, that's not meant to be a criticism, Chris, uh, because I was fully expecting it, and I'm going to use it this morning, because depending on which 
Bible you read from, the power that we've just heard is described in one of two ways. It's either described as the parable of the shrewd manager, which we heard a few moments ago, or the parable of the dishonest manager. And those two interpretations spring directly out of what is said in verse 8, when the owner encounters him as the dishonest manager and then says he has been shrewd. And so we have these two descriptions. It's hard to say because they're not part of Scripture uh, whether one title is right or wrong. But whichever one is used, it tends to actually colour our reading of how we read what happens next. So the little headings that you find in your Bible uh, are not part of Scripture. Uh, what they are useful for is giving us an indication as to what one person thinks the passage is about, although very often I find myself in a different place to the title. But also, if you know them by that title, if you're flicking through your Bible wondering where on earth that story is, they help you to find them more quickly. But I think this one is a parable told by Jesus, which probably a lot of us have struggled with at the different times we may have heard it, if we've heard it before. And Daryl Bock, in his commentary on this passage, actually describes it as the most difficult parable of Jesus to get to grips with. And so when I was looking at the lecture readings, for this Sunday, I thought, shall I go with the lectionary or shall I run for something that I'm more comfortable with? And I thought, on the first Sunday where I'm preaching from Scripture rather than giving my testimony, which I did last time, then I'd go for the more difficult task. So we've all got a bit of work to do this morning. Those of you that were here the last time I was with you, will remember me giving my testimony and will also remember me describing as part of that someone as being like Larry Grayson. And you all knew what I meant and some of you laughed, but certainly there was a sense of recognition and no requirement to give further explanation. But when I was reflecting on this a few days ago, I thought, that if we were a congregation of predominantly people in their early 20s, then I would have been able to say that and it would have meant nothing. Because they would have had no idea of who Larry Grayson was, let alone the point I was trying to make or the image I was trying to create. And one of the problems that we have with this parable that Jesus tells is that Jesus tells most of his parables in quite a succinct way because he knows that when he says something, people will understand what he means. So they will have an idea of who this wealthy landowner is, what sort of a person he is. They will have an idea about who his manager is and what sort of a person and the systems that are in place there. They will have an idea about how the tenants are likely to be responding as things are being gathered up. But we don't. We live in a world which is both distant in time and geography and it's certainly different in culture from the one that has been described. So I've been working some time with what this parable uh, is saying, but also then how it might be speaking to us. So I did check uh, with one person in the congregation beforehand uh, just how good their Greek was, suspecting that it might be a lot better than mine. Uh, and thankfully, it doesn't seem to be a million miles better than mine is. So I'm going to plow on. Uh, my Greek is, is virtually non-existent. I do use 
uh, online lexicons and, and that sort of thing to try and get behind uh, some of the meaning because some of the things which the Greek actually then draws out uh, helps us to picture uh, what exactly that we're talking about. So when Jesus is being reported by Luke as describing a rich man, then the word that Luke uses, because Luke is writing in Greek and Jesus would probably have been speaking in Aramaic, so the, the word that Luke chooses to use is plutos, which means a rich man. In our world, we shouldn't be surprised that that same Greek root is where we get the word plutocrat from. And anybody who's heard anything about those rich people, uh, particularly uh, in Russia, the oligarchs and all of those, they, they are described as being plutocrats, that they are immensely rich people, distant from the people that they live above or amongst. And they are people who are distant, not just in their wealth, but they will have several layers of management underneath them and organisations underneath them in order to deal with what they owe. So this man is not just rich in the way that we might think of people that we know as being rich. This man is rich because he is the head of a plutocracy, a vastly wealthy empire. So this is a very rich and distant man. And somebody who, unless he's told that there are things missing, may not know himself because he may have an idea of the vastness of his wealth, but he may not have an idea of every jot and tittle. And so when he is told of the, the manager, and uh, the word in Greek again is uh, a word that gives us an image, uh, the word uh, has as its root oikos, which is the word for household. Uh, the manager, which is oikomon, is somebody who has oversight, management of that bit of this man's household. He's presented as having a charge against him that he has been wasting, or many translations have it, squandering the wealthy man's, the plutocrat's possessions. If we remember the story that precedes this one in Luke's Gospel, we remember the story of how we normally think of it, and again, it's where titles can be uh, under negotiation as being the parable of the prodigal son although some people like to call it the parable of the forgiving father. And some people might even want to describe it as the parable of the unforgiving older brother. But in that, the young brother who wants his father's wealth before his time, in other words, He'd rather have his wealth than his father because in his own way, asking for his own inheritance, is wishing his father dead, is described as squandering the wealth that he inherits, albeit ahead of when it would normally be due. And exactly the same word is used in this parable to waste the landowner's money the plutocrat's money as it is in the parable of the prodigal son. And so we shouldn't necessarily get from what is being said that the man is necessarily doing his boss out of money in the way that he's been dishonest with that, but there might be something else going on and this scattering, because that's what the word means, uh, this winnowing of the money means, I think, that this man who is charged with collecting the money is not being conscientious enough in what he's doing. So the picture that we need to actually have in mind 
is how these things might work. In the way that the Roman Empire works, there are people who are charged with collecting taxes. And we know that how Matthew is called as a disciple and how the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, works out is that tax collectors are not well liked. And one of the reasons that they're not well liked, apart from the fact that nobody likes playing tax anyway, is that in order to make their own wealth, they add extra on top, which is why Zacchaeus, in his story, is so rich compared to everybody else and why nobody else likes him. It's also why, when his life turns around, he's able to give back some of what he has gathered up because he has more than he needs. He doesn't need all his wealth. He's just been making a bed for himself and feathering that nest. So it is with this man, although he's not collecting taxes, he's gathering up money on behalf of his master and he is making extra on the top for himself. And so what's happening, I think, is that in not all the money being gathered up, the man is probably making enough to feel comfortable, but not being diligent enough to gather up everything. So what I think is happening is that by some means, and this is just a parable, so it's not a detailed history of something that actually happened, by some means, the man who's in charge of everything, the plutocrat, knows that there's stuff missing because he's been told, and he comes to the man and asks him to give account. In other words, to show, literally, what he has gathered up. And he also tells him that he's sacked. As Donald Trump would say it, you're fired. But the man then starts to think about what is going to happen next. Because he's not able, by his own ambition, to dig with his hands. And because of the way that society works, he decides that he himself is too proud to beg. And so what he does is he starts to call in the debts in a way which shows not only what has been happening, but also his creativity. When he calls the first person, and there are probably uh, more people, but Jesus only tells us of the first two, then he asks him to say how much he thinks he owes and then to halve it and only pay that. And when he asks the second person and the first amount is measured in a quantity of oil, the second time is in a quantity of wheat, then he asks him what he thinks he owes and he'll have been told what the bill is and he says and he says, well, give me 8% of that amount. Now, if you go back to what the commentators tend to think of what the worth of both quantities is, the, the first amount was something like 1,000 a, a denarii, and the second amount was something like 2,500 denarii. If you take half of the first amount, 1,000, that gives you 500. And if you take 80% of 2,500, then that's uh, the, le the leftover is, is 500 again. So although there's different percentages, one is half and the other is 80%, what it appears this manager is doing is for each amount that he's asked to collect, he's adding, adding on 500 denarii for himself. And so in this story, what he seems to have worked out, in order to ingratiate himself with those people that have probably been waiting for him to turn up, and if he's too late to turn up, not being paid the money, which is why he's got into trouble, because he hasn't been bothering because he's been comfortable enough, he's decided to let them keep that bit that he would have been creaming off for himself 
in order for them to see him more kindly. And ingratiate has with it that sense of being in gratitude to. He is wanting to elicit their gratitude. And so when he goes back to his boss, his boss is not disappointed because he gets what he was owed anyway. But his boss is not stupid. His boss, as Jesus tells us in verse 8, says he is a dishonest manager. And that's what he expects, because that's the way that the world works. Lots of us in working life will have possibly done ourselves or known others who have done things which they consider to be perks of the job. Which may be something as simple as taking a few paper clips out of a stationary cupboard or doing other things. We don't necessarily see it as being something which is really bad and it's something which probably people expect. And what happens with Zacchaeus in his tax collecting, what would happen with the disciple Matthew in his tax collecting, and what happens with this man in this parable is all part of how the economy of the time worked. Those people who were trusted with things very often took extra on top for themselves in order to make themselves wealthy. But this man now realises that without his employer's protection, without his job, that actually he's going to be really down on his luck. And that he needs to ingratiate himself with those who he has been exploiting. So the man is being shrewd despite the fact that he has been dishonest. And those two descriptions, as I say, are often what we find in the title. And it seems that both the plutocrat and Jesus are acknowledging that this is a wise thing to do. And I think for us as Christians, then that causes us a dilemma. Because it sort of feels as though Jesus is saying to us that it's all right to be dishonest sometimes. And I don't think this story is saying that at all. But what actually Jesus is recognizing, and is true of all of us, is that we are all sinners. We are not all as straight as we ought to be. And I think if any of us think that we are not sinners, then we've been dishonest with ourselves right from the outset. But what is being said also is that whatever the man has is not his by right. The situation that he finds himself in means that he has nothing. And one of the truths, one of the maxims that we may actually share amongst ourselves is that we come into this world with nothing and we go out of it with nothing. Nothing that we have, any of us, is ours. It is all God's providence. And we will be rewarded for our endeavour in what we manage to earn. But we are blessed with that in order to be a blessing. And that's what this story, I think, is actually guiding us to. Because in order to win the good favour of those around him, the man is being shrewd in not asking for what is not rightfully it, his. But because of the way that the system works, he is being perceived as generous. Because he could have asked for what he was owed in order to see him buy for the short term. 
to give you an idea what he was owed just for the first two that Jesus mentions in his cut, not he was collecting for his boss, but in his cut, would have been the average of about three years of a normal person's wages. So he could have got by with that if that's the way he'd been inclined. But he realises that because of the way he has been, his situation is more desperate than that. So he needs to win the favour of those around. So he's seen as being generous. And Jesus is not saying that we are being dishonest. But what I think he is saying is that that which we have which God has blessed us with, God blesses us with, in order that we might be a blessing to others. In other words, if we follow a generous God, then we, made in his likeness, are called to be generous to others. Because what God has blessed us with is never ours in the first place. And what God has blessed us with, he has blessed us with in order to invite others into the kingdom. And it's almost then coming a reverse of what this man is doing because that welcoming is then part of what we are doing in being generous to others. And so what Jesus is saying is that those people who are wanting to sort of get on in this world are quite wise because they realise how the economy of the world works. In other words, if you are generous to others, then you, you're likely to be in their favour. And what he's warning his disciples about, but also being critical of the Pharisees gathered around about, is that they are holding back that which was never theirs in the first place. Because we live in the economy of God, where everything that we have comes from him, and everything that we have is not only to bless us, but those around us. And in God's good providence, we heard a bit of that right before we started worshipping, because we heard what Chris said about her neighbours. And so the question that this parable asks us is whether in the way we act, we are going to be shrewd with what we have. And shrewd means not hanging on to it and clutching it to ourselves, but sharing it with others. John Wesley was not against wealth. What he also said was that with all the money that he earned in his life, and he earned vastly more than most people did in his day, that if he died leaving more than 10 pounds, he would be a liar. And he taught those who followed him to earn all they can, to save all they can, and to give all they can. And one of the reasons that he taught that was because most people that he knew could do the first two, but struggled with the last one. And so I think that actually he should have made it a bit plainer for people and inserted a word in between each of those lines. Earn all you can, to save all you can, to give all you can, because one follows the other. It's in order that the next one happens. You earn as much as you can, in other words, you work as hard as you can, in order to save as much as you can, in order to give as much as you can. We are called to be blessed, but we are also called to be a, bless a blessing. We are called to be shrewd managers of all that God has blessed us with. And in following the mission of Jesus, be not only good disciples, 
but to be good and hospitable welcomers of others into his kingdom. To his praise and glory, thanks be to God. I said it wouldn't be easy. It's complicated intellectually, but it's also hard in the way that it actually speaks to our hearts. And so we all need to, to pray on that as we go through these coming days. We turn to our hymnody again as we sing 746 from Singing the Faith for all the saints who shared your love. So gather once again in prayer. As our nation remembers Queen Elizabeth II, we call to mind her role in the services, and we pray for all those in our own country and overseas who serve others in military and other service and all those whose lives are shattered by war, which is going on around them. We hold before you the leaders and people of Ukraine, and pray peace in that troubled land. As a nation recalls the faithful service of Queen Elizabeth II, we call to mind her compassion. We give thanks for the hundreds of charities to which she was connected. We pray for them and those whom they seek to serve. And at this time in particular we pray and commend to you the people of Pakistan as they seek to rebuild their lives after devastating flood. And we pray for the various aid agencies working there and alongside the agencies which were already on the ground. And 
as the nation grieves the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. We pray for her family, who mourn a mother and grandmother, and we remember all those who at this time are saddened at the result of the passing of a loved one, who have suffered a recent bereavement. We pray for the family of Chris Caber as they express their concerns about his shooting at Streatham Hill. We also pray for the family of our brother Geoffrey as they gathered in this place on Friday and carry with them back into the everyday nature of their lives, their grief and their memories, their hurts and their thankfulness. We pray for those for whom it is a time of anniversary Pray for those for whom pain is constant. And we pray for those for whom an unexpected occurrence ambushes them in reminding them of a loved one and things suddenly become raw. But also we pray for tears of joy and thankfulness, as well as sadness. May they know your comfort and your peace. As we prepare to celebrate the life of Queen Elizabeth II, commend her to your eternal care. We pray for our nation that as we've been united by grief, we may be united by commitment to serve one another. And we pray that for the commonwealth of nations. And also for those who in all sorts of other places and cultures have seen her faithful example of service as it is set. and for the way in which her independence in sovereignty has been an example of non-judgment, of accepting, and in particular in her own family, in meeting with leaders of Sinn Féin. a shining beacon of forgiveness. And so we pray for the safety of world leaders as they gather. And we also pray that you would bless King Charles III and the Queen Consort, give them strength and wisdom, that above all things they may serve you in the roles to which you call them. And we pray that too for William as he is becoming prince of this nation in the way that he is called to serve and be amongst those people with whom we live. I mean, God has remembered your faithful servant, Queen Elizabeth II. We thank you for her faith, for the wisdom and strength with which you blessed her. Bless us and all your children 
that we may follow her example of trying to live by the example of Jesus. We may live in peace and unity and serve each other's needs. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We sing hymn number 470. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. book that I bought when I was trained to be a minister. It was before I'd actually been fully accepted as a candidate for ordained ministry under the pattern of training in those days, so I didn't know for certain that I would be a minister. And even up to, prob to a probationers committee, we don't know whether we're going to be ordained. I bought it because I thought it would be a sign that I might be leading communion one day. As I have the page open, I also have all the crinkles of every burial I've done when it's rained, because the pages are now really crinkly. On the page opposite where the last words are said during committal, is a rendition of the Lord's Prayer which we prayed earlier and where we pray usually forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us I have written in the margin debts and debtors 
because that's what they say in Scotland. And the man who had failed to notice the fact that I had an English accent all the way through said, you're English, aren't you? Because you said trespasses and not debts and debtors. May we pray that. We pray the same word in Luke's rendition as the words that are used in forgiving the debts in the parable that we heard earlier. So as well as remembering the parable, we need to remember whenever we pray this prayer, we are praying something really serious and is a release from debts and trespasses, but also is an act of God's generosity. Lord, we want to be the body of Christ, longing to bless the world with love and transforming society here and now with acts of your generosity. Help us not to hold on to the things that we possess, whether that be money or ourselves or the debts that we harbour out of lack of forgiveness between one another. O Holy Spirit, we offer all that we are, all that we have, all that we do, and all that we harbour to ourselves. So take us, our gifts and talents, all that we are, that we may be generous to others as signs of your kingdom today, that we may be blessed, but more importantly, that we may be a blessing to the name of Jesus in whom we pray and a blessing to his name to others amongst whom, whom we are called to be a sign of his presence as your body, as the body of Christ. Amen.